Okay, hello everyone. My name is Rebecca Roscoe. I serve as a senior research associate at SMU Data Arts and I use she, her pronouns. I am a mixed race woman in my thirties with dark brown hair that is down, a light pink sweater with pink floral scarf and gold framed glasses. I'm sitting in my office with a blurred background at my home in the traditional and unceded territory of the Lenni Lenape people now known as Pennsylvania. On behalf of our team at SME Data Arts, we would like to extend our sincere thanks and appreciation to each of you for joining today to learn more about our state arts vibrancy index and to learn from our amazing panel as they share more about their state's bright and vibrant arts and culture communities. Before I introduce today's presenters, I want to first take a moment to pause and acknowledge the indigenous peoples of all the lands that we are on today. While we come today on a virtual platform, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the importance of those lands. From coast to coast to coast, we acknowledge the ancestral and unceded ter territory of all of the First Nations people. We specifically honor the Apache, the Caddo, the Comanche, the Koshaada, the Tonkawa, the Wichita, and the affiliated Kichi, Waco, Tawakani, and Lenni Lenape peoples upon whose traditional territories SMU Data Arts now exists. We invite each of you to share your own personal and local land acknowledgement within the chat. And now for some housekeeping, we are going to keep everyone on mute during the presentation to ensure the best sound quality. At this time, we ask that you take a moment to explore some helpful features within Zoom. First, the Q&A feature, um, that's where you are welcome to uh, add any questions you have about the content of today's webinar. We invite you to add questions at any time today. We also have the chat feature, which allows you to reach our team for help troubleshooting any technology issues you may experience. Closed captioning is available for this webinar. If you would like to activate that feature, click that CC icon to turn on closed captioning. You will be then prompted to view closed captions via subtitles or by live transcript. You will also see a subtitle settings tab to make adjustments as you need to. If you need assistance with any of the features I just mentioned, just send us a chat. And finally, to preempt the most common question we get, yes, we will have a recording of this webinar and we'll send you a link to it so you can review later and share with your colleagues who are unable to join us today. So here are our, our goals for today's webinar. We will start our time with an overview of the State Arts Vibrancy Index and some helpful key takeaways, along with exploring the map for additional insights. Before we conclude, I'll be sure to share some ways you can stay connected with our work and our research. But today, we'll spend the majority of our time with our panelists as they share with us their work in vibrant arts communities. And with that, let's jump right into the State Arts Vibrancy Takeaways, where I would like to welcome our Director of Research, Dr. Jen Benoit Bryan. Jen manages our research agenda for projects ranging from program evaluation to workforce demographics. She prioritizes research strategies that pull in new voices and those that are collaborative, that co-create with communities, and that spark and support lasting change in the arts and culture sector. Welcome, Jen. Thank you so much, Becca. I'm delighted to be here with all of you today and really looking forward to this conversation. Uh, a quick visual description. I'm a white woman in my 40s, uh, located in Chicago on the traditional lands of the Council of the Three Fires. I am wearing a pink sweater and black rimmed glasses sitting in my home uh, in front of a quilt that I made. Uh, Really delighted to um, be sharing the stage today with a number of other incredible speakers with great expertise and perspectives. Um, so I will keep my portion of this research discussion short and brief, uh, but really delighted to share more about this newly developed kind of framework of state arts vibrancy with all of you. A little bit of grounding in what arts vibrancy means first. It's really our best effort to capture the range of arts activity that's happening within and across communities. Uh, and we have three main types of measures that funnel into an overall arts vibrancy score for counties, for cities, and for states across the country. Those include the kinds of uh, inputs that are happening, the number of people and organizations involved in the arts. It includes the dollars that are generated through revenue, through expenses, through employment uh, in the arts and culture sector, and the range of different levels of government support of arts and culture, state, federal, local, uh, that we can incorporate as part of this picture. 
we use a very data-driven approach to developing these ranking systems where we set all of the measures ahead of time um, and then just report out on kind of who lands at the at the top and uh, along the full spectrum of rankings. We also have committed to only using dimensions here and inputs that are available at a pretty micro level, right? The county level, at the zip code level. Um, for this examination, we're always rethinking and looking for new sources of data that are part of arts vibrancy. Uh, so please feel free to get in touch with us if there's something you think we should be including that you don't see here. Uh, this overlays the kind of map of state arts vibrancies with the most vibrant states in purple, um, kind of coalescing across this color range to the bright yellow where vibrancy is lowest. We've overlain the cities, the small, medium, and large cities that have the top arts vibrancy um, that we have shared in other reports here. So you can kind of see how there's some alignment of cities in those purple areas, but also lots of cities um, within gold and yellow areas of the country as well. So what goes into this picture of arts vibrancy? Uh, I've got a little more detail here on the 13 distinct measures of arts vibrancy that we combine together into one overall score. And you can see both the kind of categories that I mentioned for providers, dollars, and government support here, as well as the fact that the kind of relative weight that each of these measures has towards that final score for arts vibrancy ranking varies a little bit. And that is determined by factor analysis, really think about kind of an overall arts vibrancy uh, kind of framework here and use statistical analysis to weight these appropriately so that we have the most confidence in the kind of underlying dimension of vibrancy that we're trying to measure here. The data sources that we use uh, include mainly data from the census and IRS 990 forms, um, which are scored again at that zip code level, city level, county level, and state level. Happy to answer any questions about methodology that you might have. The only other really important, I think, factor to keep in mind here is that we want communities to be on as equal a level playing field as possible for arts vibrancy. And so we adjust all of the metrics and data that we pull into this analysis based on per capita um, kind of population levels, as well as based on cost of living. So that a city that just has a really high cost of living doesn't kind of get over indexed um, with respect to things like expenses and revenues relative to a city with a lower cost of living. So that's all reflected uh, in the measures that we develop. This has been a really fascinating time to look at states and arts vibrancy. In the past, we've looked just at the city level for our arts vibrancy scores, um, but heard from some individuals within state arts councils uh, about the utility, the kind of value that a look at the state level could provide. And so we really dove in and we're curious to explore the really varied contexts and cultures of states, looking to see how arts vibrancy might be correlated with other contextual variables. Uh, we looked at a lot of different possibilities and had many conversations with uh, other thought leaders uh, and colleagues to think about this. Uh, and three kinds of key relationships emerge that we think are worth highlighting. The first has to do with the relationship between arts vibrancy and the extent of rural versus urban population within states. And overall, we saw a pattern within this data where states with higher rural populations tended to have lower levels of arts vibrancy, with some really notable exceptions that we'll talk about later. Uh, we're also doing some further analysis of rural counties across the country to try to understand what arts vibrancy looks like and how it's supported in unique ways in rural parts of the country. So keep your eyes tuned for that. That'll be coming soon. Keep your eyes peeled, your ears too. What I'm mixing my metaphors here. Uh, another level that we looked at for states was looking uh, at poverty rates. We were curious to see whether or not there was a relationship between poverty levels within states and arts vibrancy. And indeed, generally speaking, we saw that states with higher poverty rates tended to have lower arts vibrancy rates, again, with some really interesting and notable exceptions. New York in particular is a fascinating exception there. Uh, and then we looked to see how much overlap is there in arts vibrancy within the state context and within the city context, and found that the nine highest ranking states in arts vibrancy all have at least one city that are listed in the top 40 arts vibrant communities of 2023. That said, there are a number of states with arts vibrant cities that have pretty low overall vibrancy. You can have pockets of vibrancy in a state with, with generally low arts vibrancy, and the reverse is also, is also possible. So those kinds of edge cases are things 
that, that buck the norms are particularly interesting to explore. So I'm going to focus uh, a little bit on rural population and arts vibrancy today, as that's going to be a theme for the conversation with our speakers coming up in just a few minutes. Uh, so I've listed here the top 10 states overall with respect to arts vibrancy ranking, and we've included the percent of the rural population within each of those states. And you can see that um, we have a lot of states that have rural populations under 20%, which is the national average. Uh, New York, though, is a little bit higher than some of the other, many of the other cities, or sorry, states uh, at this level. Uh, and there's a few outliers. So Minnesota is a fascinating outlier at 28% rural population. Virginia also has higher than the average kind of level of rural population with 24.4%. And then Oregon here, right at the kind of average level of rural population, 20%. So really interesting to think about the places where that relationship between rural population and arts vibrancy um, is, is distinct from the overall pattern that we're seeing. And speaking of that distinction, we did pull the top five states that have a rural population that's above the national average uh, and ranked them in terms of vibrancy. And so just so you can get a sense of where these land, we've highlighted what their arts vibrancy rankings are on a one to 50 range, um, but also the percentage of rural population here. So the top five states with uh, above average rural population rank from fourth to 14th uh, on our ranking. And you can see Vermont as a really notable outlier here in that it has the highest proportion of rural population at almost 65% and a really high arts vibrancy ranking in the top 15 at 13. So we're really excited to learn about the many ways that um, um, arts and culture organizations are working to support vibrancy within that state. We have a lot of resources and tools that we've made available. We're always thinking about additional ones though. So if there's something that you need that you don't see on our site, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. We have provided a state arts vibrancy map and some detailed data tables. So you can dig into all 13 of those metrics for each state to understand their rankings and uh, to take a look at overall rankings. You can also navigate through the data set that has um, lots of different measures at the uh, city level and kind of look to see connections between those things and download graphics that we have available uh, for advocacy purposes or for sharing purposes or learning purposes. Okay, I'm delighted to, I, hopefully this grounding in the research is helpful as we shift into our community conversation. I can't wait to listen and learn from our panelists. So I'm going to pass it back to Becca. Thanks, Jen, for that really helpful overview. And again, if anyone has questions as we go through, feel free to put them um, in the, the chat or Q&A future um, for us to discuss. So at SMU Data Arts, we believe that the data always tells a story. And like um, Jen alluded to, this year's state index is no different. To help tell that story, I'm pleased to introduce our guests. First, we have our facilitator for today's conversation, Ryan Stubbs. Ryan is the Senior Director of Research at the National Assembly of State Arts Agencies, where he directs NASA's research team to provide high quality information for the benefit of state arts agencies and the arts and culture field. His areas of expertise include public funding for the arts, state policy, and the creative economy, as well as state arts agency funding, services, operations, and grant making. Ryan also represents state arts agencies in NASA at state, regional, and NASA research forums and serves as NASA's primary research liaison to federal agencies, foundations, consultants, and scholars who are researching public support for the arts. We have uh, also today Susan Evans McClure joining our panel. Susan serves as the executive director at Vermont. Arts Council, where alongside board and staff, she shapes the future vision and direction of the council. Susan leads the administrative team and works to foster external partnerships with artists, cultural organizations, and communities across Vermont. Susan also serves as the coordinator for the Vermont Creative Network and as the contact for state advocacy efforts. And finally, we'd like to welcome Brian Rogers. Brian serves as the executive director of the Oregon Arts Commission and Oregon Cultural Trust. He is a longtime arts and culture consultant who has led planning and facilitated retreats for several state arts agencies and cultural organizations across the country. His work focuses on funding stabilization and grant programs. Brian actually served as deputy executive director of the Pennsylvania Council on the Arts for 20 years before his current role at Oregon. 
So thank you so much for Ryan, Susan, and Brian for joining us. And I'm just going to shift things over to Ryan to get it started. Great. Thanks so much, Rebecca. Uh, and again, I'm Ryan Stubbs. I'm Senior Director of Research at NASA. And just to give a quick description, I am a middle-aged man with brown hair, black room glasses, a navy blue shirt, and a painting of a red ribbon in the background. So NASA is based in Washington, D.C., but I'm coming to you today from Denver, which is the traditional land of the Arapaho, Cheyenne, and Ute people. And I just want to say thanks for having me to moderate this conversation. I'm very happy to be in dialogue with two state arts agency leaders, as well as colleagues at SMU Data Arts, around measuring arts vibrancy. And I'd like to start off by saying that I appreciate the challenge of producing state rankings. At NASA, we publish rankings based on per capita legislative appropriations to state arts agencies. And we know that producing rankings is helpful for state arts agencies to communicate their relative standing in terms of state appropriations. However, those rankings can have various utility depending on where you sit in the ranking and what message you're looking to communicate. So for example, it may be more helpful to be at the top of the list to communicate a strength, or it may be more helpful to be at the bottom of the list to communicate a need. And then I guess you being in the middle is somewhat like being in purgatory, and you may not be sure what to do with that information. So this is to say that I appreciate how Data Arts has communicated about the arts vibrancy ranking, and I appreciate the opportunity to talk about some of these nuances and utilities of using these data uh, with two unique states that rank high in both vibrancy and with higher percentages of rural populations and communities. And I also think that these examples are going to be useful to everyone viewing today because we know that helping to build vibrant communities is going to be relevant to nearly all arts organizations and agencies. So to kind of get us started off in this conversation, first we're just going to kind of get some background and context about uh, your agencies, Susan and Brian. Uh, then we'll talk a little bit more about the rural context, uh, about the um, implications of the ABI, as well as support for your agencies in general. But to start off, I uh, wanted to ask you both um, to provide just an overview of your agency. This could include your mission, your goals, role, and perhaps any kind of programs or things that you're excited to talk about. Um, so we'll start with Susan. Great. Thanks so much, Ryan. Um, and thanks very much for having me today, both to SMU Data Arts. Uh, it's great to be part of this conversation and some really interesting data I'm excited to unpack with my fellow panelists today. Uh, I am a 40-something um, white woman with short brown hair and a blue shirt sitting in front of a tan colored wall. And I'm coming to you from unceded Abenaki territory here in Vermont. Uh, so Vermont, yeah, the Vermont Arts Council. So the, the council's really been the state's primary provider of arts funding and advocacy and information since 1965. And our work here is based on the understanding, really one that I actually probably don't need to sell any of you on, <laughs> that the arts transform individual lives, that they connect people more deeply to each other, energize our economy, and sustain the vibrant, vibrant cultural landscape of Vermont. So our work is really in three main areas. The first is grant funding. We offer direct grant funding that invests in artists, organizations, arts educators, and municipalities. We run multiple grant programs supporting things like arts education residencies, supporting artists to create new work, um, grants to support infrastructure improvements that are integrated into public arts, and, and lots more of that. The second area that we work in is um, capacity building and support for artists, organizations, and educators to help them really be able to do their best work and thrive here. And that can look like anything from being a resource on accessibility in the arts uh, to offering a direct training on climate change initiatives, uh, to offering spaces for informal conversation among arts education, arts administration, and education executives too. And our third area of focus is in um, building the creative economy. And we do that through a statewide collaborative effort called the Vermont Creative Network, where we really bring together people from many different sectors who are all working in the creative economy together to um, advocate for our sector, uh, demonstrate its impact, and get, get people together. Uh, there's, you know, we do we do a lot for a small a small council in a small state. Um, I think, yeah, I think I will leave it there, right, Ryan? And I'll I'll pass it back to you. Thanks. That's great. Thanks for that introduction. And Brian, let's hear from you. 
Yeah, hello, everyone. Uh, it's Brian Rogers here. I'm the executive director of the Oregon Arts Commission and the Oregon Cultural Trust. Um, both the Oregon Arts Commission and Cultural Trust have distinct boards, but shared staff and some distinct programmatic staff. And we are housed in Business Oregon, which is the state's economic development department. The Arts Commission has been around for well over 50 years, and the Cultural Trust is about 20 years old. And it was created out of a movement to help support and raise visibility and funding for um, culture, arts, heritage, history, humanities, preservation across the state. And I'll talk a little bit more about the uh, Cultural Trust later on, I think. And, um, uh, you know, one of the things that we do, many of our grant making portfolios are much like what you see across the country at state arts agencies there's a general operating support there's a way to reach rural organizations through a small operating support program arts and education uh, also uh, we have a program called arts builds community where we work with arts organizations and community organizations to kind of come together uh, to help address or create a solution a community-based solution or address a problem or opportunity. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that we're really excited about working on is a creation of a cultural district program. And there's about a dozen, maybe more states across the country that have a cultural district program. And there are areas with a high concentration of arts and culture facilities and events that serve as like sort of anchors of attraction for relocation or visitation in communities. And they reflect the community's unique cultural heritage through its built environment and history. And they shape, showcase the region's artists and cultural traditions while increasing social engagement and visitation. And it may be linked up with uh, our Main Street program in the state. Uh, I forgot to describe myself. Uh, I am uh, in my 50s, have gray hair, wearing glasses, and I'm in, in my home office in Portland, Oregon, where many bands and tribes have occupied uh, the land here over the years uh, for thousands and thousands of years and uh, probably way too many to list. Um, and uh, yes, I'll turn it back to you, Ryan. Great. Yeah, thanks for those introductions. And I wanted to get to a question that talks about this concept of vibrancy, right? I think it could be a little bit of a nebulous concept and Data Arts has done a great job of operationalizing this concept through data, but also just want to hear from your perspectives, what does uh, vibrancy or creating arts vibrancy mean to you and how it relates to the mission of your agency? So uh, I'll kind of just go back and forth, Brian, um, if you want to start us off. I think here in Oregon, we, we kind of, we consider vibrancy as not only like nonprofit um, arts organizations and cultural organizations and, and artists, of course, but also the for-profit industry venues. And there was a lot of um, visibility and funding during the pandemic for venues that are for-profit and nonprofit venue, venues and arts organizations that flow through our agency. So, um, and it's the first time that we were ever funded um, for-profit venues. So what that kind of created was this relationship of um, we're in this together kind of thing that the whole sector, the whole arts and culture, entertainment sector should be, um, you know, lockstep, that we should be working together to support our efforts. And there's some great advocates that have come forward to help to help in that effort, not just for them, but for the good of the vibrancy across the state, which is extremely um, fascinating and uh, really important work that has taken place over the last couple of years. So that's kind of what our silver cloud has been since 2020. So, you know, silver lining to the cloud uh, since 2020 is um, building a much wider network of people that we are working with. Ryan? Yeah, interesting point how it is both the for-profit and non-profit sectors and the community as a whole that makes up vibrancy and not necessarily just particular arts organizations. Uh, Susan, how would you answer that? Yeah, I think um, Brian made a great point, and we've actually taken a very similar approach with the Vermont Creative Network to really look at how those nonprofit, for-profit, uh, independent contractor, those are all kind of false 
barriers. And we learned, especially during COVID, that um, we need to be united as a field of a creative sector um, or an arts and culture sector who needs to be working together. Uh, and when I think about vibrancy, I mean, for us, this might be like too Vermonty of an answer, but it does kind of make me think of the word, like the vibe of a place, right? It's that kind of intangible part of a community where things are really dynamic and alive and exciting. Um, a place where you want to be and visit and live and work and create art. But we also know that those places don't happen by accident. So our agency has really leaned into creative placemaking work and done that by partnering with other organizations and funders and agencies to really um, support efforts to bring creative folks into the downtown, develop, downtown and economic development space. So we have partnership programs with um, Vermont's Agency of Commerce, with AARP Vermont, with Vermont Community Foundation, many others. Um, and with our creative economy work, we often say that we're putting creativity at that intersection of economic development and community development. And we're being really intentional about supporting creativity to build more equitable and inclusive communities. And I think that is when you really hit that vibrancy sweet spot is when all of those things are working together. Yeah, I love that, that it's a that it's a vibe. There are these kind of intangible things that we know that we want to create and how do we make them tangible? So, uh, interesting stuff. So um, just moving on, that is also another kind of contextual question um, or yeah, contextual question and set up. We know that you know, every state arts agency is different and operates in a different environment. Um, and there are a couple of aspects of the structure of your agencies that are particularly unique. So for Oregon, I'm referring to your relationship with the Oregon Cultural Trust that you mentioned briefly, Brian, and Vermont, I'm uh, referring to your status as the only state arts agency that operates as a nonprofit organization. And just for some context, I'd uh, like to hear about uh, how those unique circumstances relate to your mission and your abilities to serve um, people across your state. So uh, Susan, if you don't mind going first. Sure, happy to. Yes, so we are, um, we're the, the butterfly of the special snowflake of state arts agencies. Uh, and we are a separate nonprofit, but we were created in state statute and funded primarily by state and federal funding. So we are um, not alone in Vermont, actually, where there are several of a few, I won't say several, there's a few of us that are called the quasis, the quasi state agencies. So um, that does give us a lot of flexibility. Um, it's unusual, but it allows us to do private fundraising. So we're able to both, um, we're able to increase the amount of funding that we're given out, giving out on top of that really vital state and federal funding. Um, and since 2019, we've actually been able to move that private philanthropic support into our grant making specifically to be able to increase our grant making um, in a few of our grants by over 50% with that private support. And that's been great. And it, it does really help us, gives us a lot of flexibility. I really, I, I don't want to lean in too heavily to it because we'll talk about this, I think, a little later, but it really will never be a replacement for state and federal funding. So it's a, it can be a double-edged sword at times, but generally gives us a lot more flexibility um, and an ability to really build coalitions with external partners in ways that it can be challenging to do uh, if you're working just from right inside state government. We're kind of on the edges. Definitely unique. Um, Brian. Yes, well, we're we're firmly in state government. And I think what makes us unique is that uh, you know, we have the Oregon Cultural Trust, which is uh the only statewide tax credit in the nation. And the way that works is a a, a taxpayer can donate um money to the cultural trust, and that donation is a 100 percent state tax credit. So Ryan, if you give me a hundred dollars, if you were Oregonian and you gave us a hundred dollars come tax time, which is right now, you could click a box, write in a hundred dollars, and your 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 uh, refund, hopefully you get a refund, would go up by a hundred dollars. Pretty amazing. There are limits, you know, for an individual it's five hundred, for a couple filing jointly, it's a thousand. We have about eleven thousand donors to the Cultural Trust, which raises annually about five point five million dollars. With those funds, we have a, a portfolio of programs. We have a relationship with the five cultural partners, the Arts Commission. I actually send a grant uh, from the Oregon Cultural Trust to the Arts Commission, uh, Humanities, Oregon Humanities, Oregon Historical Society, and the State Office of Preservation. 
and each of those organizations uh, makes awards and supports programming across the state. We also make direct grants uh, to a couple different categories to organizations across the state. But what's really exciting is we have a decentralized program called the county and county uh, and tribal coalitions. So each county and tribe receives a block grant from the cultural trust, which they then make uh, project awards in their service area. And there's about 450 local project awards made each year across the state. So we're in every community with some type of funding and or support. Um, so that's kind of what, what makes us unique is the relationship between the trust and the arts commission, like having one person run both, two distinct boards. There are some distinct staff, but a lot of shared staff to manage it. So um, when you look at the total you know, grant making portfolio, there are a lot of different programs and a lot of different sources of income revenue to fund those and a lot of different organizations and individuals and projects that we fund. Them. Yeah, really interesting stuff in it. Uh, to me, it's that these um, unique circumstances are really in service to the constituents and the people of uh, the your respective states and how to deliver services even more broadly. And there's different ways of doing this. And there can they can be very they can be extremely varied. Um, so good to hear some of that context and wanted to then shift to a little bit of our conversation about rural um, and serving rural communities. So we know that defining what is rural, what place is rural, isn't necessarily an easy task. There are multiple valid ways to classify geographies as rural or urban, and we know there's often a, a continuum from frontier places to rural places to exurban to suburban to various densities of urban ge geographies. So some of this is about perception about how residents understand their communities and geographies. And so when we say that Vermont and Oregon have higher rural percentages or higher rural uh, population percentages, um, does that make sense to you in your um, positions in your state? And just if you could explain how you perceive kind of the rural ruralness of your state. And let's see, who went last? Let's go uh, back to Brian. <laughs> and well, I think when people think about Oregon, who may or may not have visited here or don't have a lot of familiarity with the state, I think the picture comes into people's mind of a very lush, you know, pine tree, Douglas fir, uh, you know, um, Portland, you know, the micro beer, you know, brewing, the food scene, you know, that kind of thing. And, you know, a lot of outdoor um, activity. And um, that's true for a slice of the state um, that is west of the Cascade Mountains. Uh, east of the Cascade Mountains, it's a uh, high desert and a lot of ranching, a lot of farming. Um, you know, if you go over towards Ontario, Oregon, which is very close to Boise, in fact, it's in, um, in a different time zone and um, a very rural uh, area of the state. And most of far eastern Oregon uh, affiliates more with Idaho than with the rest of Oregon. And the same with Southern Oregon, they affiliate more with Northern California than they do with Oregon. So, you know, our work in in those areas is looks a lot different than it does in what we call the Willamette Valley, which stretches from Portland down to Eugene, where the University of Oregon is. And, um, you know, we, we are working very closely with um, some funders, the Eastern Oregon Funders Forum, which includes folks from the Ford Family Foundation, which is a funding from the timber industry, old old timber industry, as well as the Roundhouse uh, Foundation, which is funding from uh, the Columbia Sportswear. The owner from Columbia Sportswear um, settled in um, Sisters, Oregon, which is right outside of Bend, and their focus is um, uh, just rural organizations, and they've really shifted to funding more of arts and culture. And so we have kind of, and, and, and again, Oregon Community Foundation, which is the state's largest foundation, has regional offices that um, work with us as well in rural areas. It's really about, you know, like going there and being present 
doing a lot of travel, learning what people um, people need or want or desire. It's about helping them connect with each other in some cases, um, and you know, communicating with other funders about um, how we might leverage each other, if you will, how we might you know support things together. Thank you. Great, and go ahead, Susan. Yeah, I, I mean, I think Vermont, Vermont's really rural by any and all standards, right? Our, our population is only 650,000 people. Our biggest city is a whopping 45,000 people. Um, and I, I do tend to think that our rural character and experience here really encourages creativity in different ways, right? Throughout Vermont's history, really either by choice or by necessity, people have just kind of had to make it work. You, you build what you need. You work with your neighbors. Um, and you tend to rely on your neighbors a lot, maybe even if you don't talk to them that much. Uh, and, and in Vermont, we actually, we're so rural. <laughs> this is like a funny competition. Well, we're so rural, but we're so rural that we uh, we don't have county government here, which is really um, interesting because it a lot of those services that county governments are really important. A lot of the services county governments provide, even the way they interact with arts funding um, is vital in a lot of other states. And here we tend to have kind of statewide efforts and then really hyper-local efforts. So a lot of our work is in connecting, connecting those two where we can. And, you know, I've really leaned into our ruralness, but the other thing that's um, unique and different about Vermont is that we are rural, but we're actually pretty close to areas that are not rural at all. So we're within pretty easy driving distance of three major cities that have significant arts and culture scenes, you know, Montreal, Boston, and New York. New York's a little further, but Montreal and Boston, Montreal is very close. People always forget that. Montreal, major international metropolitan city is um, like 90 minutes away from Burlington, our biggest city. Um, and what we've seen over the last, you know, 50 or so years is that artists and creative people can really live here, live their rural life in the hills, but have access to artist, artistic markets in major cities and still make it work. So we are really rural, but we um, are not really isolated in the same way that other rural areas are. Yeah, so you're uh, making me want to move to Vermont and Oregon, where I can just live in this palatial uh, bucolic uh, scenery and uh, do art. <laughs> maybe, plan, maybe one day. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you, we talked a little bit about this in your answers, but I also just want to hear a little bit more about how you work to serve rural communities. And do you have any <clears throat> particular programs, initiatives, or strategies that are aimed at those populations? So uh, first, for you, Susan. Yeah, um, you know, because we are so rural, really all of our programs are aimed at rural populations. Um, and actually, our work is about getting out to the most rural areas, just as Brian said. Um, there is a we are a small state, but we have a mountain range right in the middle. So it's a little hard, just similar to Oregon. It can be really hard to get from one side to the other. Um, but our, you know, post COVID now our team is back on the road and we've been hosting grant seeker workshops around the state. Um, and we know that the way to reach the most rural areas is, is to go there really just showing up can be so powerful. Uh, we want everyone in the state to know what resources and programs are available to them. But we also really want to make sure that we, as the state arts agency, are hearing from those rural areas to really understand what they're experiencing. Um, and, and often we find that the very best work is being done in the very smallest areas. Um, and, the, you know, I don't I don't necessarily think we talk about this enough, but I think it's really important that our work um, needs to respect and value the rural experience. Uh, you know, I grew up in a really rural area. I live in a really rural area on 70 acres in the woods. And there's, there can be a connotation that rural is like backwater or lacking culture, um, but that's obviously not true. <laughs> and we at the Arts Council really start from a place of um, respecting and valuing what's happening in rural Vermont. And I think that approach just really matters um, and, and helps us uh, reach people, but also build better connections. Great. And you know, Brian, I think you spoke to this a little bit about the characteristics of some of these places, but anything that you would add about how your agency serves or um, strategically serves um, rural places? Yeah, it's a discussion we have a lot at WESTAP, the Western States Arts Federation, you know, being in the, one of the Western states, the 13 Western states, we're talking about a lot of geographic area. It's, you know, a lot of us have to drive 10 hours from one side of the state to the other. There's a lot of ISO isolated communities that are not close to a metropolitan area. 
Um, and oftentimes uh, schools uh, are in session four days a week because a student might be on the bus for an hour and a half, two hours one way. Um, so they have a longer school day, but fewer days a week. And they also, um, you know, are responsible for helping out around the ranch or the farm or whatever the case may be. So when we um, think about providing uh, like arts and education services in, in rural areas, it has to have it, it, it it's it has to have a different kind of way of operating than it would in an urban area. And you know, I mentioned the county and tribal coalitions, uh, you know, receiving funding that they through a local decision making process can award what they see as value in their communities. Um, they develop cultural plans and so forth, but it's really about you know um, letting folks um, do what they can with what they have. Um, and we do have nine tribes in Oregon, and we um, you know have relationships with them. And you know um, tribal members do serve on our commission and cultural trust. And it's always a learning experience working with the sovereign nation about you know what works for them and what what doesn't and you know uh, reservation life and they're each individual uh, they're not you know no one could ever lump together uh, the tribes as being similar they're very distinct and, and uh, operate differently so that's been um, very interesting work for the arts commission and cultural trust to um, work in in those communities as well yeah, and I think that's another great point that like rural communities are not monolithic, right? There are unique aspects to each of them. We don't want to kind of say they're all the same. Um, there's similar ways to serve them. There are different ways to do so. Um, any, uh, Susan, would you add anything about how uh, your agency serves rural places? Um, I think I start. I started answering that one. So I, I think right. I, I think we covered that with the getting out there in the communities. I we. Um, yeah, we, we really try to get out there and be in person as much as we can. Now that we're in person again, we really try to be in person as much as we can. And there are a lot of miles that that puts on the car. Great. There is a question, if you don't mind, I can pop in with it, um, that's come in through the chat about the largest sources of support for the arts. And it's this one's specifically about Vermont, um, Susan, but I think it could be interesting to think about how that might align with or be different from Oregon. Yeah, I saw that. So the question was really the largest support sources of support for the arts about how the public, private, or foundation kind of lenses. Um, and I, I think here it's a real mix. We don't, um, our size, our scale as a state arts agency um, is not going to fund any one organization completely. Uh, and so every organization that exists here really operates on a mix of state, public, private funding, um, much more private funding usually uh, on a larger scale. Um, we have an interesting thing, and I don't know if that's part of our rural characteristics or this like wanting to hide out in the woods mentality, but um, it can be different to do fundraising, private fundraising in Vermont for arts organizations. Uh, people don't necessarily want their names on stuff in the same way as we see in other larger cities. Um, so we have a lot of anonymous donations in Vermont and uh, that is just different here and, and it makes it, it's great because those people really support you, but it can also be harder, you know, for a new organization to, to find those people sometimes. Great. So uh, I think this is a good segue to start talking about the Arts Vibrancy Index and just wanted to get some reactions to the data uh, when you saw the rankings and uh, looked into the data for your respective states. Is there anything that jumped out to you, resonated with you, anything else that you might want to communicate? And um, let's see, let's go to Brian. I think the first thing that really popped out to me is that, wow, Oregon is in the top 10 of the most vibrant states. Um, and when I stepped back and looked at the other states, you know, speaking sort of, you know, kind of characterizing them maybe generically, they're they're fairly uh, they're fairly wealthy states. They have um, typically large metropolitan areas, um, and you know it was kind of surprising in, in that we kind of got in the top ten on that on that uh, report there. Um, you know, Oregon, the GB, 
the GDP of Oregon is average. It's middle. It's like ranked in the, you know, the 40s. And, um, uh, you know, our rural population, as you pointed out earlier, Ryan is right, you know, at the 20th rank for rural, you know, we're average there as well. So the arts vibrancy, that's what kind of surprised me. But then, you know, the other way to look at that is that, you know, we're the headquarters of Nike uh, outdoor sports, you know, there's a lot of design. In fact, there's a designer, color designer for women's apparel on, on the art, arts commission board. We also have like day, day kind and Danner and keen footwear, Leatherman, rough wear, which makes dog backpacks. You know, there's all this kind of creative, creative space going on. And, and, um, Leica Studios is here, which made uh, animation studios, which made uh, Coraline and Box Trolls. So there's a lot of spinoff industry, very creative kind of place. Um, you know, in in funding, state arts funding, we rank again average. We're 41st in the nation, actually below average in terms of what uh, the legislature allocates to the Arts Commission, 41st in the nation. But you know, there is a a shift that funders are making. There was a lot of attention paid to the environment and social causes. There still is, but more and more, there's become more attention paid to arts and culture. And so I think that's beginning to help support a lot of uh, smaller organizations as well as the large and everything in between. Uh, but the smaller organizations are kind of emerging and growing fairly rapidly, uh, which is, I think, adding to that vibrancy. Susan, go ahead. Yeah, I think um, I was really, I mean, I'm always struck by per capita rankings because we are very often at the top. You know, we have the most libraries per capita, the most breweries per capita, the most arts and culture nonprofits per capita, as we see in ABI. Uh, and we just don't have a lot of per capita. We don't have a lot of capita to be per. Um, but it really speaks to the fact that there is a lot going on here. I was also struck even uh, outside of Vermont too about the poverty rate correlation, right? That the um, states with higher arts vibrancy rankings tend to have lower poverty rates. So when you look at what the data is measuring, a lot of that is really state and federal investments. Um, so it seems to say that there's still a really big need for arts funding to be distributed more equitably nationwide uh, and really keeping poverty and access top of mind when decisions are being made about where that state and federal funding goes. That, that we're not done with that conversation and there's a lot more to do there. Right. And then sticking with you, Susan, um, with the, the ranking from a state perspective, are there ways that you hope to leverage the insights from the findings and the data or um, anything that you'd like to speak to how you'd like to use it? Yeah, I mean, it's you know, good data is always important. It helps us make our case to the state legislature, the federal legislature, or federal government, to everyone and anyone who will listen to us. Uh, and I mean, I, I will add that in, in thinking about this, right, it's great data and, and it's important to use it. Um, but I also think that we need to have a larger shift um, as a field where we really need to be thinking uh, not just on how do we make our case for this one thing, but really that we need to be kind of laser focused on increase, increasing funding for the NEA and NEH in a substantial way. Um, and as a field, you know, I think we need to be setting like huge ambitious goals around that, right? Like let's increase, let's triple federal funding over the next 10 years for the arts. You know, all of us know what it takes to build vibrant and connected communities across the country. You can see where that is happening through this data. Um, we know what we need our citizens to be able to do. Um, and we also all know and see that access to the arts and humanities will achieve that for all Americans. So not to act like I'm like giving, you know, on my soapbox here, but until we start thinking on that level, we can have the best studies and the best visibility. But until we're ready to really take our seat at that table and act like we belong there and get it done, then more studies are more great studies. Yeah, and I, I agree that the connecting this uh, the data to what we want to see um, for expanded um, funding for the arts is important to uh, make the connection between these are these are things that we want for our communities. These are the kind of communities that we want to have, and there are uh, arts based solutions to help uh, get to those outcomes. So. Um, Brian, uh, same sort of question with you. Uh, how do you hope to use this data or how do you see it fitting into your work? 
Yeah, I think one of the roles of a executive director of an arts commission is subtle, um, you know, advocacy that planning information and data in um, you know legislators' minds, governor governors' minds is really uh, important, and it needs to be a soundbite. It needs to be something that they can hang on to fairly quickly. So the first thing we talk about is, oh, you know, Oregon is ranked 41st in the nation for per capita funding from the legislature. That's not good. And then, oh, we're ranked number nine in the in the country in terms of arts vibrancy. That's good. Is there a dichotomy there? Can we, you know, close the gap somehow? And how can we do that? And then working with other sectors like travel, Travel Oregon, um, you know, Oregon is a destination for a lot of Asian countries. Japan uh, loves Oregon. You know, um, there's no sales tax here, so that's a huge advantage to um, to folks who are traveling. And you know, we work on different programs with Travel Oregon, you know, the state's promotion agency, as a destination. And also, you know, we just I think. A lot of folks are, are experiencing the same thing, but we just finished the Arts and Economic Prosperity from Americans for the Arts rollout. And, you know, you start to weave together a lot of information and data about the arts and culture sector and its impact and importance across the state. And people slowly start to understand uh, and verify that, you know, these are national studies and um you know they they folks like smu put a lot of energy thought leadership and um you know uh, just putting that together is really important here at the local level yeah i agree i feel like the more data and more tools that you all have in your arsenal to communicate about the value of the arts the better um and so i know we're running a little long in our conversation here. There's so much uh, good stuff to talk about, but wanted to uh, shift to you, Jen, uh, for, from um, SMU Data Arts perspective. Uh, how do you hope state arts agencies, political leaders, et cetera, will use the, uh, use the data for their work? And uh, what value do you hope people find from the index? Yeah, it's been a great learning experience for us to share this data out and start to hear how people are activating it. I think Susan and Brian did a great job of talking about some of the uses. It's We talked a lot about how much granularity to go into. Like, Do we release all 13 of these measures or just an overall ranking? Do we even release the full ranking or do we just highlight the top performers like we do for cities? And ultimately we landed on the sort of framing that everyone has room to grow in some dimension of this kind of sector, arts vibrancy. And so we're hopeful that by being pretty granular and sharing a pretty open book about what we're using to rank these states, um, that that provides real leveraged opportunities to talk about, like just as you said, Brian, where are the places where we're behind, where we can kind of kickstart or make a case for further support? And where are the places we can celebrate and you know continue to lean in to successes relative to others? Uh, but I love the framing too, Susan, that you shared about like how do we make the pot bigger, right? It doesn't have to be drawing from one thing. Like, can we all collectively use data to advocate for for a greater expansion of resources federally um, and a real equitable focus in terms of how those resources get distributed? So we're we're learning still. We're eager to hear from people about how they might be activating this data, about what other kind of data points would be useful as you're talking about data and making a case for it, uh, and and excited to to you know just to provide pull the curtain back a little bit in terms of the whole range of metrics that we're looking at here. Oh, you're on mute, Ryan. Thank Sorry, you. It happens to me at least once a day. Yeah. <laughs> so. Um... I, I know that we're getting to the end of our time, and I want to just give us uh, some time to wrap up. But just, uh, you know, there's more questions that we have, and I'm sure we could talk about this for a long time. Hopefully, uh, we'll all see each other at some point and uh, be able to talk about it over a, a beverage. But um, with that, I think we want to wrap up. And I just wanted to say thanks for uh, having me, and thanks to Susan, Brian, for your participation, and to Jen, of course. And uh, I think I'm passing it back to Rebecca. Yeah. Um, thank you, 
uh, that brings us to the end of our time together, like Ryan said, and just echoing Ryan again, um, Susan and Brian, our panelists, thank you so much for joining and contributing to such an enriching conversation today. And, and thanks for Jen as well um, for laying that groundwork. And then a really special thank you for to Ryan for leading today's uh, discussion and panel. Um, so on behalf of SMU Data Arts, we just want to share our sincere appreciation to all of you who joined today. Um, like I said before, we'll be sure to share a recording of today's conversation with everyone who registered. And we really hope you stay connected with us um, and our work throughout the year as we share more research in the field. So here are some ways you can stay connected um, via social media. Um, I think that concludes today's presentation and you all have a wonderful rest of your day.